Hi, this is Fast Forward's Mike Zipser, and with me in the studio is our special guest, Bill Campbell, writer and publisher. Bill, welcome to Fast Forward. Oh, thank you, Mike. Now, you run uh, Rosarium Publishing. Yes. And uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you publish? Well, actually, um, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> well, what we publish so far is um, uh, my, my, old, my older stuff, and then our first major project was uh, Mothership Tales from Afrofuturism and Beyond. And um, right now, what we're basically concentrating on a lot is uh, speculative fiction and comics. So right now we have um, Day Black, which is by Keith Cross, which is about um, a vampire tattoo artist. And that's a digital comic that we're turning into a graphic novel and switching back and forth. And then we have uh, Mothership, as I said. Yeah, let, let's talk a bit about Mothership, which was kind of the first big thing that, that hit from your company. Um, this was partially funded through Indiegogo. Yes which is a crowdsourcing thing, and, and in the interest of uh, full disclosure, I was one of the backers. Yes, and thank, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And that's where I first heard of you and, and, and your company. And so what was the idea behind Mothership? Well, um, my, my first novel is a, a science fiction novel. And, you know, and I wrote that back in like 98. And I had the idea of writing uh, science fiction back in 91. And at that time, you know, it was only Delaney and Butler. Um, as science fiction writers as, as, of color. Uh, uh, yes, uh, black science fiction writers. Yeah. And um, so, you know, you kind of felt like you were lost in the desert for a long time. And then as I started, you know, publishing and writing other stuff, I just started noticing that more and more people were popping up. Um, but then with uh, my last novel, Coontown Killing Caper, when I was doing um, science fiction conventions, you know, uh, a lot of people wouldn't know who these writers were. And so in my head, all of a sudden I was thinking, somebody needs to come out with an anthology to uh, you know, display all these writers out here who are doing this. And it took me about five minutes, and I was like, man, it's going to be me. <laughs> <laughs> so so that, was basically, that was basically the idea. So it uh, focuses, Mothership focuses around people of color. So either the authors had to be of color and or the protagonist. So no trusty sidekick, none of that. I just wanted... You know that statement, and there are forty authors. Yes, in in the book, yeah. all short fiction, mm -hmm. um, and it's I think what combination of original and reprint. Yes, mostly reprint, but um, some original. I just really wanted to turn it around really quickly, mm -hmm. um, just because I had the idea and I was, and that's the way I write. So I think that's just kind of the way that that I do things. It might just be because of the job and family and all that stuff. I have to do things in spurts. So I just really wanted to turn it around. So I was just like, you know, reprints are fine. I just want a document for this moment in time, sort of. And the book really took off. It really hit at the time when th this was part of the discussion amongst in science fiction. Yeah, I mean, it was weird. I mean, I, it, it's weird when, um, for me personally, to when I actually come up with an idea that people actually want, I'm used to quite the opposite, you know, convincing people, no, 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 you want to read this, but this was quite the opposite. Um, you know, when Ed and I, uh, Ed Hall, my co-editor, you know, when we started asking people, uh, the response was instant. And, you know, so at some points we were like, but do you know who you are? Because <laughs> like, I don't think you know us. So, uh, yeah, it, it, was, it was something that, that a lot of writers really wanted at that time. Yeah, and it, and it, it is called Tales from Afrofuturism and Beyond because it's not just you know, African and African American. You've got um, writers from the Philippines, you've got Native American, you've got Latino, you've got, I can't even think of it all. It's like everywhere you can think of, there's Asian. Mm -hmm. It's... It's all in there. Yes, it takes it takes the idea of diversity and just kind of blows it apart, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and they're all really good stories. Uh, thank you. Really strong. Work. Well, I mean, one of the, I mean, one of the chief tenets of Afrofuturism is is to be all inclusive, you know. And it was interesting to me just all of the, I guess, for lack of a better word, diverse array of writers who were who were very much supportive of it and. You know, took it took it upon themselves, or you know, took the mantle upon themselves, saying, 
well, okay, I might not be of African de descent, but I'm cool with Afrofuturism, or uh, we are coming up with a futurism of our own, and it's very much influenced by Afrofuturism. So I think, in an odd way, no matter where a lot of these writers are from, they feel some sort of affinity towards what Afrofuturism or the idea of Afrofuturism is. Yeah, and why don't you talk a little bit about what Afrofuturism is? I don't know if a lot of our viewers are that familiar with the term. Well, um, you know, it's something that's... Uh, but outside of just exactly what it sounds like. Well, well, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's kind of, it's, it's a really hard term to pin down and I'm not, and I'm sure there'll be a bunch of academics who'll sit there and go, no, that's not it. But, um, you know, Mark Derry, I think this was in 93 or 94, uh, coined the term Afrofuturism because he was looking at uh, different musicians like Sun Ra and uh, Parliament Funkadelic and Earth, Wind and Fire, who um, were kind of in embracing the space themes in, in ways of defining, defining race or, or redefining the role that black people can play in, in society. Um, and I kind of look at it now as sort of like this, this idea that we are placing ourselves you know, in the future, in the past, in the present, um, because history is no longer just written by the victors. <laughs> you know, nor is the future, nor is the present. And I think that a lot of people, and, and it varies, you know, and Afrofuturism goes in comics, it goes in fiction, music, uh, fine arts, low arts, whatever you, I mean, it is, it is across the board. And in a way, um, there will probably never be one or never really should be one definition of it. But to me, it's just in a way of placing, like, I'm a history nerd, so in a lot of ways sometimes, and things that I write, it's a way of examining history in a way that others have not in the past, you know, because in a, in a lot of ways, you know, our American history and world history is kind of whitewashed, and you don't know, you know, like 16% of the Revolutionary Army was black and it was fully integrated. But, you know, you, you look at pictures or re reenactments and there aren't any black people. So, in a way, Afrofuturism can go back and examine those things. Um, and it can go in the future and say, hey, look, this is what our Earth looks like now. Why doesn't these representations of the future look like this? You know, because, as I said in the book, you know, if you take, you know, the, some of the premise that, you know, racism is dead in the future, which is kind of an assumption that we often have in, um, in um, science fiction, if you, if you take, like, an Earth crew, right, uh, and we use American definitions of people of color, six out of seven, six out of every seven persons on that ship would be a person of color. But usually it's like maybe two out of 15, maybe. <laughs> maybe. maybe. <laughs> Which to me is a very powerful statement, an inadvertent statement. But you know, if racism is dead, and still all these people aren't involved, right? You know, what does that say? Yeah, exactly. So like to me, I have to place myself there. I have to place myself here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in um, Sunshine Patriots, which is, um, was that your first book? That was my first novel. First novel. There is, you know, people of color in it. It's a, it's a, I think somebody referred to it as a Rastafarian military yeah, yeah. science fiction novel. Well, um, I'm half Jamaican, so I was, I was, the protagonist is Jamaican. And there are a lot of voodoo and Rastafarian, and, and since I'm Catholic, there are a lot of Catholic. It's, a, it's an oddly very religious, religious military science fiction <laughs> <laughs> book. It's, it's a little weird. Yeah. Um, now, in, in Rosarium, one of the things I've noticed, and it also is in a lot of your books, mm -hmm. is a, a focus on um, black culture, American black culture, and w what it is and where it is and what it means, and the impact of other cultures on it? Um, well, to me, um, the, one of the chief um, principles of, of Rosarium is that people should be able to tell their own stories. Um, so it's not necessarily about race, 
Uh, but if somebody wants, I mean, you know, Day Black, it's a, you know, <laughs> he's a vampire tattoo artist, but he is, he is black, you know, so it's very much about that. Like I, and no matter who we have coming on board, they can tell their stories no matter who they are. You know, we have an upcoming book, uh, The End of the World is Rye, which is about an angel who comes down and almost causes the apocalypse over the finding the perfect sandwich. Um, you know, and it's just, it's a fun story. Uh, Brett Cottrell, uh, he's white, <laughs> you know? Um, but it was such a, a fun and unique story that that was something that I want. Like, I just don't want it to be about, it, it has to be about whatever the author or the artist's vision is. And I think that that's a constraint that I would like to lift off of people, that they could just be weird, mm -hmm. you know, and be different. And you know, if you're Asian, you know, like the the upcoming anthology that we have, the C is ours. Um, then be it. Don't worry about what anybody else is saying. Don't worry about another person's gaze. You know, you be you. Let's talk about the C is ours a little bit. It's another themed anthology yes. that you're doing. This one is what is it? Southeast Asian steampunk. steampunk. Yes, it's uh, Jamie Go and Joyce Chung. Um, it was just uh, one day on Twitter, uh, they were talking about steampunk and representation and, you know, being told that this wasn't steampunk enough or whatever they were writing. And I was just like, okay, you know, I was feeling kind of heady <laughs> after Mothership. <laughs> and Jamie's in Mothership. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just said, come up with something and do it. Uh, and let's just see what happens. And so... They took me up on it. So, you know, right now it's in the call for submissions phase, and I think it'll be coming out January of next year. Is there going to be any Indiegogo crowdfunding of this one? Or? Uh, I'm going to hope not. <laughs> gonna, well, you know, the funny thing with Indiegogo campaigns and Kickstarter campaigns is they're a lot of work. Mm, yeah. They're a lot of work. So if at any point, you know, we can not do one, then I'll, I'll choose not to. But if we if we have to, I will, uh, because you know these things are important. Yeah. So I, I'll I'll do the work. I have no problem with working. Yeah. Let's talk about some of the because there you've got books with art in them too. Yes. Uh, one is sitting at the table is Pitch Black Rainbow, which is art of John Jennings. Yes. Um, which is a stunning um, art book. It's a collection of of his pieces. Yes. Um, he does portraits. He does all kinds of things in a style that we're talking about is very reminiscent of, of woodblock prints. Yes. Well, from what I understand, um, John comes from that. Like, he was trained in, in woodcuts, and from what I understand, he, he actually likes to maintain that kind of look. But John's a professor at uh, SUNY Buffalo. He works a lot with uh, representation and hip-hop and blackness and popular culture. So a lot of his art, and comics, and a lot of his art reflects that very much and you know he's an incredibly stunning artist an incredibly yeah. talented man and that's something that I really like like he and Keith with the day black artist I mean you see their stuff and it's like wow you know and it's theirs yeah. <laughs> you know it's theirs it's not cookie cutter as I said you be you like mm -hmm. that's that's the kind of thing that I would like with Rosarium to do is yeah. just let them be free and John with pitch black rainbow and he and Stacy Robinson, they did the Black Kirby exhibit, if, if you've seen that at all. No. Oh, they, um, they used, the, they reimagined a lot of Jack Kirby's work uh, as, as black superheroes and just discussing, you know, Kirby's, cool. <laughs> Kirby's relationship and the way his labor was treated with how black people's labor is treated right. and, and the black and Jewish, you know, identities here in America. And it's, it's, it's incredible. But, uh, he, uh, John and uh, Stacy, they're working on a comic book for us now called um, Kid Code, which is sort of like a hip hop Doctor Who, oh, cool. talking about the the five principles of hip hop. And and I'd love to see his art yes. in, in a graphic novel. Um, and you now Day Black, the art in there is it's a very stylized. It's not it like you said. It doesn't look like anybody else's work. And the story is great. Oh yeah, no, I, mean, I, I just um, I, that's another person. I um, was on Facebook one day, <laughs> and somebody was like, "Hey, check out Keith," and you know, I clicked on it, and I just instantly fell in love with the man. I was just like, "My goodness!" Like, 
I mean, it's it's not so much a comic book as, as it's like an art book with words in it, yeah. right? And he just has this way that, like, so many of his images are just iconic. Like, you could, you could take, like, three quarters of e any of his books that he's working on and just frame them. Yeah. Uh, and it's just an absolute... Well, the dream, the art he did for some of the dream sequences oh, in, yeah. I think, the second yes. thing yes. are just amazing. They're full-page... You know, mixes of images from these dreams that the vampire is having. Oh no, we've been we've been exceedingly lucky. Yeah. <laughs> you know, exceedingly <laughs> lucky finding Keith. You know, John, Stacy. You know, Ed and I. You know, meeting each other and working together. Um, we and and Brett and and all of these things have been just by chance. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, Brett and I were sitting next to each other at a at a book festival. I mean, it's just. Yeah. These, and John and I were sitting next to each other at a comic book festival and just, <laughs> you know, just gelling, you know, and, um, and that we're all on the same page. It's yeah. just kind it's, of... It's great when something like that can happen. Oh, yeah, it makes all those other years <laughs> worth it, <laughs> you know? Yeah, because looking at your bio, you did a lot of different kinds of jobs over yes. the years. Yes, Well, you know, I, I left college... Um, during a recession, and it just kind of, <laughs> and the great thing about it, being a Gen Xer is pretty much our entire adult, adulthood has been one recession <laughs> yeah. after another, so, so constant recreation. Did you always know you wanted to be a writer? I decided I was going to be a writer when I was nine. When you were nine? When I was nine. My mom took me out to Hollywood. She used to make industrial films for Westinghouse, uh. you know, Circuit Breakers, Nuclear Bombs, and, um, you Stuff know, we all have around the house. Well, yeah, you know, things that you make movies about, yeah. and um, just... As a kid, I left Hollywood wanting to be a writer. I, I have no clue why, but since then, yeah, I've been writing. That's great. You've been writing, and now you're publishing. Yes. And um, it's very exciting. I can't wait to see what happens with The Sea is Ours. And, oh, I'm very excited about it. And I, I can't wait for more. When's the next uh, issue of Day Black? Well, the new issue, issue number two, just came out uh, March 4th. In 2014, just to make sure. Yes, 2014, watch this. sorry. <laughs> um, yes, and then it's bi monthly, so okay. May. Um, and then we'll take those first three issues and make it into a graphic novel and sell those while we still keep the digital comic going. Yeah. That's very exciting. And then. Oh, I can't wait to see it on The paper. other comic that's coming sounds good. It's, you've got a lot of things going on. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bill, um, thank you. Congratulations on all your success and good oh, luck on you. the future. Um, I can't wait to see what else you come up with. No, thank you. Me neither. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's it for this episode of Fast Forward. So from everyone here in the studio, this is Mike Zipser saying take care.